So your presenters today are myself, Nathaniel Holmes, and Kyron Pagulayan. And just like in the image, I'm the tall, goofy one. Kyron is the smooth one with the moves. Uh, so um, maybe about eight or nine months ago, we, under good, uh, we underwent a series of trainings uh, so that we can improve the, our delivery method in our organization. And the result of that is uh, we've organized the content that we have into smaller chunks. And we wanted to be able to provide you with uh, more self-paced options so that you can learn on your own. But additionally, we wanted it to be more interactive during the live sessions. Um, with the Case Mr. Calpads transition, we've kind of are walking the line or straddling the fence and that this training is not as interactive as they were for end of year. How, and we are heavy into demonstration, so that does require for us to dictate and show a lot of the content today. Um, but we do have interactive elements. And as a consequence of this reorganization, uh, we learned in our first version of this training that the three and a half hours that this training used to be required every bit of that time. So as fast as Kyron and I went, uh, the content we had was too much for two hours. And so since no one wants to sit and listen to me for two hours, as pleasurable as it is to listen to Kyron talk about cow pads, you have to also listen to me, and that's not worth it, right? So what we decided to do was to focus more on the batch file submission in this training, and to compensate for that, we will focus more on the online maintenance of data population. Um, so that way we can get you out of here in two hours, cover all the content because the validations are the same. But if uh, you didn't attend Tuesday's training um, where we discussed it with that audience, uh, it may be a surprise to you. So I just want to set the expectation that this one is heavy batch, and we will complement it again on Friday with heavy online maintenance. So our objectives today are first, we want you, the audience, to be able to identify the different file types expected to be reported for fall one, determine the data that is required from your student information systems. We want you to be able to perform the submission process through online maintenance and batch file uploads. And we want you to be able to resolve those errors as part of the submission process to overcome any reporting roadblocks and we will do this through scenario discussion and demonstration. So this is the agenda. We usually begin with an overview, then we demonstrate online maintenance, batch file submission, and then wrap everything up. Well, today is going to be overview, batch file submission, wrap up. So let's begin with a discussion about the background of the student profile and the fall one data population. So the student profile records are required for each CalPAD submission. An enrollment must exist prior to any other record types being posted, right? So you have fall one, fall two, end of year one, two, three, and this year we're going to reintroduce a different version of end of year four. Student records are relevant in each submission. Student profile data that's relevant for fall one or required for fall one are these six file types. The SCNR is the enrollment. It's highlighted in purple. And you have to submit the enrollment to establish ownership of your student data. The SINF, the SPRIG, and the SELA, the Student Information, Student Program, and Student English Language Acquisition, come through batch file submission to your, uh, from your local uh, school information system through batch file submission into CalPads. You're going to manually upload each of these files, right? And then these two new file types, the SPED and the SSRV, are for students with disabilities. And these files come from your special education system, and they are going to be pushed into CalPads through the application program interface. We call that the API, right? So all of this data is coming from the, your LEA, uh, but through different methods and means. So. The student profile uh, data population that is required for fall one is the 
basic building block for the rest of the data reported in CalPAT. The enrollment programs, English language acquisition, we will help determine the course enrollment EL services needed for fall two, right? In end of year one, these same file types need to be updated so that we can report concentrators and completers. Again, the focus is this is part of the student profile, and the student profile is essential element of CalPATS, right? And then program participation of that data that you may submit now will come into play and be reported in reports at end of year two. Discipline and absent summary are the sum total uh, of, of events that happen or attendance throughout the year. But the reports can be aggregated and filtered by uh, race ethnicity, right? When you're trying to find out if students have been su suspended proportionate, right, to demographic populations, uh, you need to know the student information, which has race and ethnicity. And then end of year four, students with disabilities. Of course, there's student data. You're also going to have to identify uh, demographics and special ed program and services. And so this is a great place to start if you're new to CalPADS. So uh, quickly an overview. Uh, the information, the data comes from your student information system, right? There's two systems. Um, you have to obtain an SSID, whether it's for a new, completely uh, unreported student, new to CalPADS, or if you're obtaining an SSID for a student that already exists, right? CalPADS validates your submissions, it stores your student data, it generates new SSIDs, it matches existing student demographics, and enrollment data to an SSID request, and it provides the data for state level matching, right? And the state interfaces through uh, fossil youth and direct certification matches of your student data. So the SSID mentioned in the previous slide is required for all K through 12 public agencies for students enrollment in CalPATS, right? And the SSID, is a unique 10-digit random system-generated non-personally identifiable number. SSIDs are used to track students longitudinally, that means over a period of time, uh, determine, it, determine accurate dropout and graduation rates, as well as link students to assessment scores, uh, services, accommodations, it's critical that when we request SSIDs for existing students or brand new students, we take care to preserve the integrity of the data reported. So we do have a question for the audience. And if you would uh, um, add your answers to the chat box, I would greatly appreciate it. Can you tell me what is ownership? When we say ownership in CalPads, what do we mean by that? So I see short answers, right, from Leslie, enrollment, uh, LEA enrollment, Terry, uh, student is currently enrolled from Matthew, um, belongs to LEA for enrollment period. Billy Joe, I like that answer the best so far. Shakina, I think that's how I say your name, the current LEA who's responsible for the two student record, and that is correct. I think you all have grasped it. Um, just I prefer a couple answers other than not over others. So ownership of an SSID allows the LEA to submit and update records, right? So thank you, Shakina. The enrollment is related to the, the, the ownership is related to the student's enrollment period. So I don't think I saw a wrong answer. Several of you focused in on that, and that's true. Like Gina said, LEA enrollment. Ownership is through the enrollment period, right? And so SENR start end dates determine the period of ownership of student records and CalPADS. To add, update, or delete student information, and by that we mean all the associated file types, you must have LEA ownership of the student record. And so this slide can be used as background because the ownership and how it affects 
student information or student programs is slightly a bit different, right? And it's dependent on file type. So there's something for you to review, but I'm not going to walk through every file type. Okay, so there are several factors that impact how often LEAs maintain student data, right? You have local enrollment procedures, uh, management expectation, competing responsibilities. You have local reporting needs, right? You need SSIDs for LPAT, CAS, pre-ID, direct certification, foster youth matching, and special ed services. You also need uh, to submit data in CalPads for assessments, right? Uh, you have submission timelines and reporting deadlines. So how frequently should data be maintained in CalPads, specifically your student data? So if you would be so kind again, in the chat box, uh, write a sentence, maybe two, about how frequently your LEA maintains data in CalPads. What would be the advice you would give someone new? So already we have a, a difference, right? I think Don says once a week, but Billy Joe says monthly. Judy says two to three times a week. Sean says at a minimum every two weeks. And Leslie says daily. Okay, so that's great, right? Because you all have different uh, expectations and time constraints, right? So how you submit data and how frequently you submit data to CalPads is totally up to you. But what is recommended is uh, that you submit it frequently, right? It's on, and you should update it on an ongoing basis. We definitely did not see anyone say for the submission or seasonal. And I've talked to LEAs in the past that have described CalPAT's uh, submissions as seasonal. And if that's your perspective, you're going to fall woefully behind and you're going to have trouble certifying especially with the addition of students with disability data, right? And so CalPads submitting data on an ongoing basis, whether it's daily, weekly, or monthly, makes it easier to select the correct SSIDs for transferring students. Students come and go all the time. It ensures that LEAs have access to current data, helping LEAs place new students in appropriate programs, right? So you may not have a complete CUME file, but if you need to uh, know if a student's in a migrant program or um, maybe there's special ed uh, services that they're getting, uh, it minimizes your workload during the collection window. Most importantly, it minimizes my workload during the collection window, and it ensures that the ODS is up to date for assessment, state matching, accountability. Yeah, it was, uh, I was about to interject. Uh, the last line is more appropriate for LPAC testing and also for SBAC. So it's important that um, all of these are updated regularly, as, as, uh, especially TONS requires about one to two days before um, the data is reflected. So Kyron uh, was mentioning in the spring, if you're not familiar, the CAS testing and TOMS service that we use, uh, you update your information in CalPads. But that's not immediate. It's going to be a 48-hour window yeah. before your student appears. So if you're doing this regularly coming into testing, it will already be updated. That's a great point, Kyron. So for fall one, what do you need? What would be the reporting survival kit? You need the appropriate user roles, right? So you need to be able to search for your students. The SCNR edit and view role allows you to submit the enrollment file and then all the associated edit and view roles are needed for the different uh, file types. Someone is going to need a SPED edit and view role because they have to submit uh, special ed data through the application program interface. And someone's going to need the SSRV role, view and edit, to submit the services associated with the special ed program. So although they may not have a need to go often into CalPads and look up students, they need credentials. Your special ed person will need credentials to submit the data through the special ed system. 
Okay, and then you're going to need the free and reduced price role uh, for direct certification. All right, and so the, the, you need to find your results. And then CalPads documentation. What resources? User manual. It's the best resource you have. It's accessible on the internet. You can Google search, and it comes up quite frequently now. It's in the footer of the CalPads. It's also in the left navigation. Uh, the CalPads code sets recently updated. File specifications. Careless, all recently updated. CalPads data guide. That's my favorite CalPads document other than the user manual, and it's being updated now. The valid code combinations. Not my favorite document, but very useful. Um, it's really useful for fall two and really useful for uh, what will now be the students with disabilities data submission, the SPED and the SSRB files. So, how does CalPads get, how does data get into CalPads? There's essentially two ways, right? Online maintenance or batch upload. Online maintenance, you report students one at a time. You edit data manually using the user interface. Uh, there's certain uh, functionalities, uh, not limited, but exclusive to online maintenance, right? Um, modifying a student's gender or name has to be done in online maintenance. Uh, there's a manual foster youth match in online maintenance. And? The ELAS correction codes, that is only available in the online maintenance uh, function. Functionality. And so there's going to be reasons why you need online maintenance, and that's why on Friday we will do online maintenance. But many of you, uh, and we do think it's more efficient to do batch file uploads, right? And so batch file uploads allow you to do more than one student record at a time. You enter the data in the SIS or through an Excel file, and then upload the extract into the CalPads. Right, and so with a batch file, the only data entry you're doing is in your student information system. You don't have to do it first in your student information system and then do it for an individual student record using online maintenance. Now, new this year for CalPads, again, is the API. The application program interface allows students with disabilities data, that's the SPED and the SSRV record, to transfer directly into CalPads, okay? We'll talk more about that later. And so regardless of your method of submission, the process is largely the same. Right? You first enroll your students, which includes requesting the SSIDs. You verify your matches. Right? This is an individual step because you have to take care. You have to do your due diligence. Then once you gain ownership, you see the handshake in yellow and the handshake in blue, you have control of the student record for your enrollment period. You can submit and you are required to submit the associated student data to complete the student profile, right? In the student profile, you're establishing the demographics in the student information, the programs that are the student is eligible or participate in, the student's English language acquisition, special education program, special ed services related to the program, Right, That entire profile has to be built out for fall one, several different file types. And then you have to regularly maintain the student data because student data changes all the time. So this is what it looks like, right? The dependencies for all your files uh, as it regards to validations begin and end with the student enrollment. Once you have student enrollment submitted, you can submit all the other file types, right? The green files come from your student information system. They're going to be submitted through batch file into CalPads. The two orange files are those special ed files being submitted through API. Notice that the SSRV follows the SPED. You first have to submit an SCNR file to have ownership, then submit a SPED record, then you can tell us what services are related to the SPED record, right? The recommended order is probably best because um, there's a discrepancy extract associated with student with disability data. And so the student information file, if it's submitted before your SPED record submitted, it will decrease the results on this extract. And we're working on a data population uh, training for special ed currently 
And so we will explain that with more detail in that training. Um, or if you were been, uh, fortunate enough to attend uh, one of the vendor trainings, uh, Brandy or Shiloh have described it there. And I'll leave it at that. So we're going to skip online maintenance, right? And we're going to do a demonstration of SSID enrollment, right? And so just real quickly, the student enrollment file is used to establish ownership of student records and CalPads. It determines cohort inclusion and cumulative enrollment counts. It designates district of geographic residence for transfer students. And it gives the student their enrollment status. Um, the exits we will save for end of year because you do have to exit the students in CalPads, uh, but currently the focus of Fall 1 is getting these students enrolled. So let me switch my screen. Okay, so um, I fooled myself. I thought I was sharing the program. I was sharing the screen. Hopefully, I didn't drag anything. I didn't want you to see like Marshall's head floating on a <laughs> on anything, an ostrich or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so um, right. So uh, Marshall currently is doing CalPads basic. So if you're brand new and you uh, feel like I'm skipping through a step or two. Please attend the basics. Marshall explains the navigation in great detail. Uh, I'm not going to do that. All right. And so uh, I'm already on the file upload screen. I've selected my file type, right? And I'm beginning with the SNR. And I'm going to choose my file. Marshall got real nervous. He might, you might have seen a picture of, of Marshall on an ostrich or something. So. This is what I was prepping to make sure that only presented what I wanted to present today. I'll show you a picture of Marshall later. I'm good at Photoshop. <laughs> and so at the top of the screen, you can see Kyle Pads is thinking, right? And file upload successful. Great. And so I probably should have did it um, in the correct account, but I didn't. So let me filter for submitter. I'm using the state level account, right? Um, I should have used, uh, we're in uh, the test environment. So you can see it says test.calpads.org. It's not real CalPads. It's a test environment, so we have fake data to preserve the privacy of real students. And I have an account that's associated with the LEA but it doesn't have view of files that I submit um, through my state level account. And so, All right, we have the files that I have submitted, right? And the one I have just submitted is in process. Um, but it's the same as this one, since CalPads takes a little bit of time. We submitted it prior to training. And so let's look at our results. I have 19 past records on one rejected record. And so this is a good time as we wait on CalPads. Uh, if you um, access the session through uh, bridge, right, the LMS, there's two attachments. There's one specific to this training, and then there's one that's for batch file uploads, right? That is specifically dedicated, that PowerPoint, to the batch file upload process. And so um, the enrollment file is a little bit different than all the other files. 
So I encourage you uh, to, uh, there's a PowerPoint associated to the SENR de data population training available. I would encourage you to download that, that PowerPoint. And so, as you can see, this is the view submission detail screen, right? Uh, a summary of results is at the top. Currently, my file status is in review. I'm reviewing it. And my errors are here. And then a list of those errors are down here, right? And so I had one rejected record, but it produced two errors, SENR 027 and SENR 0 uh, 999. So anytime you see a 999 error, ignore it. Waste no time on it. It will resolve itself when you correct the other errors. And in fact, it says that, and I've never known it to fail. So you focus on all the other errors, and it will resolve itself. So I did have warnings, but they're not fatal errors. So they won't prevent me from posting the records, right? So these are just warnings. So the first thing you want to do is resolve your fatal error. So I look at SCNR 0027, multiple primary enrollments in the LEA. I see this record here, and I open it. And it says, student school start date, 2019-91. Well, that's the correct date. I don't know why that would be triggering a problem, right? So anytime you have a discrepancy in CalPADS that triggers a fatal error, uh, you want to look at the CalPADS ODS and that rejected record. So I have my rejected record here. I'm going to open a new window, and I'm going to right-click New Window. I'm going to paste the SSID there. And this should hopefully is all review for you all, but if it's not, okay. And so I'm in the CalPEDS ODS and I have the demographic record. Um, typically, you want to do this on multiple screens. If you have multiple screens, you could toggle back and forth through tabs, but I wanted to show you uh, how we troubleshoot this error in CalPEDS. And so. Um, is it? This is it. I'm going to try to fit them both on the same screen and do a side by side. Okay, this is great. Um, so the field name is student school student start day, right? So. I'm going to make a comparison to the fields validated, and we identify the fields validated using the CalPads error list, and I'm going to look. And so I see 9-1-2019, and 2019-9-1. It's the same date. Why would I trigger an error? Well, that's why you need the error list, right? Because CalPads gives you help, but this isn't where my problem is. This is the exact same field. The other fields validated are the school of attendance. So let me make a comparison there. My rejected record, I had my student enrolled at Emerson Elementary. In CalPads, I have the student enrolled at, oh, the students enrolled at Berkeley Unified. The student can't be, the student cannot have two primary enrollments. Either the student is no longer, is either the student is at Berkeley Unified or at Emerson Elementary. I would go back to my student information system, confirm the correct enrollment, and submit a new CalPads enrollment file, right? I could, if this record in CalPads ODS is incorrect, I could update this record, but I have to make sure that, cons that record is consistent with uh, my student information system. So that is, uh, you know, a scenario, a way that you would work through your error. And we chose SENR 27 because it's um, it's quite a popular enrollment error. So we're going to go back. After we would have resolved all our enrollment errors, we'd submit new files, new files, new files, 
All of a sudden, we have no rejected records. So as we are examining our past records, this is unique to the enrollment file, right? SSID requests show up down here. Everywhere the disposition says ready, that's a request that has been made that you need to confirm and select, right? And we'll go through that shortly. Enrollment updates or exits can be posted in the school status summary. If I were to click this button, you can see each individual schools, how many records remain in the post, and post them individually. Post all does nothing for my request. It does nothing at all. Um, so there's three different types of SSID requests for students who do not have SSIDs, right? There's a match status for new, single, and multi. And so we have examples of all three. So a new match is a student that has never been in a California public school. And CalPATS did not match any demographic records, right? So you click new, and you only have two options. I can either assign the student SSID or select none of the above, or I can click cancel and not make a decision. All right? I would, if I have a student that's a transfer student, I know they've had a public school enrollment in, in California, I would not select new. I would do my due diligence, see if I can find out the middle name, the last name, look in CalPads at the previous record of enrollment to see what the SSID was, because I would expect a transfer student to have an SSID. Now, single is the result of a match, and only one match, and that match is 100. So you can see the match score at the top, 100, right? Toka Burrito is definitely this student, right? And so if I thought this match was accurate, I would select that student, and I would click Save. If I didn't have confidence, I would click none of the above. Or if this was just a student with similar demographics but not the same student, I would click New SSID. And then Multiple Match is more of the same, right? So I have um, how many matches here? So I have one. Two, three, four, five, six. So I have six kids named Captain Marvel, right? And none of them are 100%. So I have to review each of these students and their demographic information to identify, right? And some of this, right, 97, 97, 97. They're all likely to be the student I'm looking for. So I may need to look into their demographic records at the parent or the race ethnicity history to help identify whether or not this student is the one I'm looking for. This is a, a shortcut, a preview. You also can look at just the differences between the student that's being uh, the imported student, which is the student I need to match the SSID to, to the name, right? So you see it says Marvel Captain, Captain Marvel. So the name is a little bit different. It could have been transposed. So you go, you do all that. And then this one is Marvelous Marvel. So these are all potential candidates. And I wouldn't want to select one without uh, being definite. Now, as a shortcut, single and new matches can be automated if your CalPads LEA administrator gives you the auto post role in your account. You can auto post either single matches, new matches, or both. What you can never auto post are the multi. They always require revision. After I select, and this, the disposition will change to selected, after I select um, all my matches or none of the above, that I exclude them, I validate the matches. At the bottom, there's the validate match. It'll process, and then it'll give me the option to post. You post the selected matches, right? 
and that will take care of only the matches. So with the SCNR file, you may have to post all at the top and do matches at the bottom. So be aware of that, right? If you select your matches, CalPad says, okay, matches selected up here. This is where you get your notification where it says view submission details. You have to know to scroll all the way down to the bottom and select post. You see the first post button that you see won't do anything for your matches, only the enrollment summary. And so I didn't, I, I talked you through those steps because I want to preserve this data for future sessions. So please forgive me for not doing all the, the complete demonstration. So I posted my enrollment file, right? So I would then submit the next file or the next several files. And so I want to go upload. Can you open now? I'm sorry, I want 30. So I'm going to try to be done with the SINF now. about 10 minutes. So I was just telling Kyron, you know, in the, uh, trying to keep us on schedule, I wanted to be done with the SINF because soon, and CalPads is taking forever. I know you guys know about that. You guys didn't see anything. All right, so the student information would follow the SCNR file, right? And we're good to go. Now, if I wanted to add additional files, because all I've submitted my SCNR, I've posted my SCNR, I would click add additional file and do the program and the CELA as well. So let me sort for my file. And I apologize again for having a state level account. And apply. And so I submitted my uh, student uh, enrollment or uh, information, and it's in queue. And so I have one preloaded again. Ha <laughs> ha! Preparation. And I have 12 past records and one rejected record. So let's review that file. And here are our results. Great. And again, the first thing you want to do is troubleshoot your rejected records and then move on to your past records, right? So it says SAINF0046, invalid student race code and student race ethnicity missing indicator combination. So let's just look at this rejected record. And so I have this combination of two fields in my file. I'd reference the CalPads error list and look at the two, the rejected record. It would identify the two fields, but those are in the name. And then it would refer me to the valid code combinations document and it would tell me what the problem is. Um, the error, quite frankly, is that I said that the student race let me see what it says. 406? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Student race missing indicator field value is in. So I have no, no data in race code number one. Although I have race code two and three, I said the student race indicator is not missing. But I have no data in race code one. It doesn't, you can't omit one. If you submit one, you have to, sub, I mean, if you submit two and three, you have to submit one. So it was just a, an error in my file, right? Student race code should have been populated here, one, not in two and three. 
And so although my race isn't missing, it's not correctly populated to the file specifications and the conventions, and that's what triggered the error. So I would resolve it by populating the data correctly in my student information system, and then I would resubmit the file and move on to my uh, pass. Once I have 100% pass record, Sorry, now that I got to the point where I passed all my student information records through several iterations of file submission, right? CalPAS requires you to submit a file over and over. You have no more failed records, right? I assure all my data is getting in. Um, I can see my past records, right? And I can cycle through the different pages because tenure time isn't much. Notice there is no post all button or functionality down here other than opening a record to look at it in more detail, right? And so I would just post all. And that completes the student information portion, right? Um, it's quite simple. Uh, there's not a whole lot of matching involved. Um, and that's where I'm going to submit my demographic records and whatnot. And so we will tab over back to the PowerPoint before Kyron comes on and review the student information. Just give me a moment. Well, I guess we have some questions that we missed. Where are we at with time? Okay, we're good with time. So I'll ask you some questions, and you all can ask me some questions if you have any. So let me get rid of this. This is for the demo, okay? So, so why do we say do your due diligence when you're requesting SSIDs? Why is that a mantra that we repeat over and over and over? Alarni, to avoid duplicate SSID, so you don't create duplicates, reduce duplicate records. Uh, that's, that's correct, thank you. Um, we call those duplicate records MIDs, right? Multiple identifier anomalies. You don't want those. They recruit. And that's another function that is only can be fixed one by one in CalPads. So you can't submit a file to mass correct MIDs. You have to do them one by one. Right? You will have the same kid and they'll have three records. Right? So I think we have one more question in here. What date does ownership begin? What date does ownership begin? Anna, you knocked that one out the park quick and easy. The enrollment start date. Thank you, Gina. The first day of school or 7-1. Sean, it depends. Do the students start on 7-1? It's always the date the enrollment starts. So we don't want to mislead anybody. And now the student information. So we kind of went through the demo, right? The sequencing and the timing wasn't there. Uh, the student information is required for all students. The student information is comprised of demographics and address data, and it's updated when the enrollment changes or when co corrections are required, right? Use the SINF to indicate race and ethnicity, update gender change, update address history, identify students for matching, uh, state matching, determine Title III eligible immigrants, include students in socioeconomically disadvantaged subgroups, right? And Oops, went too fast. <clears throat> Students' demographics are important. We know this. How is the data used in CalPads and outside of CalPads? So what is the data used for? What is your student demographic data uh, used for that makes it important? So in terms of LCFF, 
or state matching, right? We have several different reasons. So the, uh, on your report, the LCFF count, where are, are the demographics um, are used to identify students as socioeconomically disadvantaged in some cases or Title III eligible immigrants. They're also used for accountability analysis and students' demographics are used for state level matching like direct certification and foster youth. Okay. Okay, so let's move on and with the next file that you guys need to upload to CalPads, which is the student program file. Um, the student program is used um, to report data to CalPads regarding student eligibility in state and federal programs. So in the actual SPRG record, um, you're able, you're, this is used to identify students who are eligible in federal and state programs and accountability group subgroups. And this is new this year. Um, your English learner instructional strategies that was that came with your uh, educational services in the CRSE file before it is now being reported as an attribute under student programs. And then also this is used, the, the SPRG record is used to include students in economically disadvantaged subgroups, which is included in the LCFF report. So here, let me just um, ask some questions here right now. So what do you normally submit for, um, what programs does your LA normally submit for fall one? I know Anna and Billy Joe, I know you guys have got some fall one programs. Gate Harry. Okay. Okay, the common ones, FRPM, TK. Okay. Okay. Um, so here are the programs collected in fall one. Again, you have your free meal, reduced price meal, gate, homeless, TK, title one part, part C migrant. And then you also have programs that are um, collected as part of the end of year submission. And these are the programs. However, if you have the programs, if the student's eligibility is already established regardless of what submission period it is, it is important that you submit those SPRG records to CalPad so that the student's eligibility or participation is, uh, is already established in CalPads. Okay, so as soon as you have the data, data in your SIS, send it to CalPads. As you can see here, both fall one and end of year has two programs that are being collected. You have homeless program and TK program um, for uh, fall one. So basically homeless and TK are included. Homeless program is um, included in the FRM, FRPM determination as well. So. And so, uh, as I mentioned, there's, there are programs that are categorized as eligibility programs, which are normally collected throughout the year. And then participation programs, which are um, normally the end of year programs. How eligibility means that the um, student met all criteria to be eligible. However, they are not necessarily receiving services. And then participation, of course, means they are, they met all criteria and they are participating. So this um, classification here is automatically assigned by CalPads, regardless of the code that you send into CalPads, if your SIS still contains that eligibility and participation codes, CalPads will automatically classify a program as eligible or participation based on the program program code associated to that program. Okay, so for online maintenance, let me just demo stuff here. So let's go and do demo. We, we could just probably skip this for now and just discuss um, the student program details model. So 
based on in in online maintenance when you you go search for a student in calpads let's let's just um let me just switch to demo instead and so what i'll show you right now is how is how to go into a student student program record in calpads and also show you the models and also the fields appropriate to to that are required based on the program codes that you will be reporting so in in calpads i'll just go search for one student here if you have the the roles assigned to your account you should be able to expand the programs and uh, all other file types okay and so we just open one record. So in this student, depending on the program code that you indicate, there are fields that are not required or that are required to be populated. So let's say for program 181, it, it doesn't require any of these fields. However, if you choose program 191, which is the homeless, you are required to submit or um, data for homeless dwelling type, the runaway indicators, and the unaccompanied youth indicators. And then for uh, California Partnership Academy, you are required to populate this field. For migrant ID, if you choose Title One Parsi migrant, you are required to populate the migrant ID, which is basically an 11 digit code that starts with 06. And if you don't know this information, you may need to contact or go to the MSIN network to identify the student's migrant ID. And the education academic year, education service code, these are required if you report a program 122 record basic targeted, okay? And then if you notice, we still have the primary disability code in online maintenance, but it's already grayed out because these are not active codes starting this year. This information are now being collected using the SPED file that um, Nate will be discussing later on, okay? So since we're discussing batch upload, we go to file upload here, just like Nate did. And since Nate already established his um, ownership, we then just choose the file that we need to upload. So we now have SPRG and then I select this file here. I say test and then you can even add another file. Since I don't want to wait for the SPED to go in and be posted, I just want to submit my SILA right away since I already, Nate already established ownership of these students' records. So I can submit multiple types of files and even the same files if I uh, want. So we choose that and then test. See that. So now we upload the files to Calpads and I'm under CC Training Berkeley. The files were uploaded successfully and we get this error. Oh, no, that's not the error. It's still in queue. Okay. So notice here that we had a I already submitted the student program file earlier, so we can go ahead and discuss the batch file component of this. So we click on view. And of course you have, we had three schools in here. We have some errors, GER5 and SPRG999. And we also have some records that passed. So let's, Let's discuss 
the different errors that we normally get when submitting SPRGs. Okay, I guess we're just getting GER files today. <laughs> Let me click on this, open. Ah, look at the record. Come on, Cal Patch, you can do it. You can do it. So it appears we don't have ownership of this student, Louis Clark. So we copy this, his SSID, and we open a new tab. Looks like our test environment needs caffeine today. And two, seven, four. So normally GER5 triggers if the student, number one, has no enrollment, or if the program start date is earlier than the current enrollment reported, enrollment start date reported in CalPads. So let's test, let's see what the problem is. So based on the um, error list, GER fives occur because of the school of attendance or the enrollment start date. So here, the student, okay, the student was enrolled last year and he was enrolled at, at the district level. However, we are reporting a file with the school of attendance in, what do you call this? Longfellow Arts and Technology Middle. So that's the reason why we're getting a GER 5. So we then investigate you could either go back and check if the file was posted. Hey Nate, did you post the file earlier? You didn't, huh? Okay, so that's the reason why we're getting a GER file. So if you submitted multiple files and didn't post the SCNR, didn't wait for the SCNR file to show posted, this, are, this is the error you will get, GER 5, okay? Ownership. However, I think we had some other records here. I think I submitted another file before where we have an SPRG 70. Uh, let's just go back one month ago. If you all hate troubleshooting SPRG 70 records, you're not alone. I hate it as well. So for SPRG 70, you just have, um, it's basically an overlap of the student program that you're submitting to CalPads versus the existing program in CalPads. So we have here 10, let's check this. This was from an old file I had. So I have a SPRG 70 and it has five records. So let's look for that, SPRG 70 for Jimbo Jones. I open this, copy his SSID. So for SPRG 70, the thing that you need to look at would be the start date and the school of attendance. So SPRG 70 is just saying there's an overlapping program records at the sc same school that you're reporting the student in. So we go to this SSID and this program. And we have this record. So notice in our rejected record, the program membership start date was 8-30-2018. School of attendance was Berkeley High. However, this would have gone in if 
the membership start date was the same in the existing record. However, since this membership start date is different, you get a SPRG 70. Or if this was closed and you enter an 8 30 2018, which overlaps this, it still triggers a 70. Okay, this would have impact all other um, program types like um, migrant or FRP, um, migrant ed, what else, Nate? Gate, all of those things. And also special ed if you're still submitting all data to CalPads, okay? Then we also have here another error, which is the SPRG 276. 277, 278. These are just errors based on missing information. So since I mentioned earlier that the dwelling type, runaway indicator, and unaccompanied youth should be populated if you chose, uh, if you're submitting a homeless program, apparently these are missing in the record. So let's go to this student's record. SPRG, Richard student. So I claim that Richard student has a homeless record, is homeless as of 8-30-2018. However, I didn't populate the three, two indicators and one drop down field in here. So that's, you will get SPRG 276 when you, this happens. So let's go to this one student here. And let's try adding a new record just so we can trigger one more. So I have here the student at CC Berkeley High and I am reporting him as reduced price meal. Where's reduced price meal here? There you go. And then I say today's date. And I say validate. This should trigger a sprig to 54 error. There we go, a sprig 254 error. Why is that? That's because the student already has an existing record in CalPad. So let's open a new window. So Sprig 254 and Sprig 70 um, have the same rules. However, it only impacts specific program types. So for Sprig 254, this impacts uh, program 181 and 182, while Sprig 70 impacts um, all other program types. So right now, the reason why I'm getting an SPRG error is because the student already has an existing record here, 821-2019 with the program 181 at Berkeley High, while I am reporting a 182. So if let's say there was a change in, in the student's um, eligibility, um, there was an error or maybe from, from uh, free lunch, or, or from reduced lunch going up, you're, you're updating it into a free lunch. You first have to close the initial, the, the prior record, and then enter the new record in. You have to exit the prior record before adding the new record into CalPads. Otherwise, there would be an overlap and you get a Sprig 254 error. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to our slide here. Again, we have this information that are required and let's discuss dates of eligibility. So the main goal of uh, programs, mostly of submitting all of these programs during fall one is to, for the student to be included in the LCFF report as well as in other um, accountability reports. So to be, to be included in the LCFF reports, here are some dates that you have to 
be aware of so that the student will be included on the report. So first, the student should be enrolled and active in, actively enrolled on census day. Their homeless and migrant ed record should have a start date before the current census day and it should be open. For foster youth, the student should be matched as foster youth on census day or prior to census day. And then for the direct certification, the student must be directly certified between the months of July of July up to November. So between and all, any direct certification matching between July 2nd and November 2nd will be included on the report. And then for the for NSLP programs, program 181, 182, based on income eligibility form, um, all applications received on October 31st can be um, should be reported with either a program start date of October 31st or before October 31st to be included on the report. Any other date after that um, will not be included. So if you receive the application on October 31st, regardless if it was approved on October 31st or not, then um, you may backdate the program start date to October 31st or earlier. Any questions on that before we move on to the SILA? No questions? Nothing, okay. So now why do we submit SILA records of students in CalPADS? What's the reason why we submit, why we claim a student as an EL or an RFEP or an EO? Okay, that's correct, Larni. What else? Okay, Shakina, that's okay. Okay, so we submit SILA records to CalPAS, as um, Larni mentioned, for TOMS, for testing for LPAC, and also uh, to determine if a student needs um, English language services. So again, we have here to identify the students as eligible for LPAC, identify who needs EL services and who is being provided the services, and then also to be included in the uh, economically disadvantaged subgroup or for LCFF. And then the SILA record includes, of course, the primary language at home, and this is based on the, your home language survey, and then the English language acquisition status and the ELA status date, okay? So we have that, ELA status, primary language, and TBD for uh, those new students. So here is uh, an overview of the process. So basically when you get, when you receive the student's home language survey, you then determine if the student is, um, is English speaking or American or, or doing American sign language or is speaking a foreign language. Based on that, you then, before even um, marking them as TBD or, um, or testing them, it is important that you check CalPADS for any existing status for cell scores or if the student transferred from a different school, you may check the student's cumulative file for any um, CELT or X LPAC scores. Then if let's say you didn't have any information, then that's when you submit a record to CalPADS as maybe a TBD for the student to be tested if the student has a primary language other than English or American Sign Language. Now, if you have the scores and you see a status in CalPADS and that status is the same as what um, you have, then you don't have to submit that record to CalPADS. Okay. So here are the different statuses. You have EO, e TBD, IFEP, EL, and RFEP. So I have a question. After receiving the home language survey, 
um, of a new student in, in California, what are the possible, initial possible um, status that you could indicate for the student? Okay, TBD and TBD and EO. Very good, that's correct. And uh, okay, so initially it should be TBD and EO if the student is in enrolls in California the first time, either of these two codes. Okay. And then after that, if it's test if the student is tested, then it could be EL or IFEP. And then after the student is tested, it could be RFEP. Okay. So for the primary language. Again, the primary language is used to determine or whether or not the student needs to be assessed for LPAC, okay? And it's determined based on the home language survey. So how many times do you have to, does a student has to have to submit a home language survey? That's correct, just only once, okay? And so this should be carried over every year in his cumulative filed and and based on that you could determine the student status in calpas or on a cumulative file and for the students with um who indicates in their home language survey students who are who who does sign language for students who um who communicate using sign language or a asl if all three answers in the home language survey says ASL, then the primary language is 37. However, if let's say one or two of those fields indicate a different language, then you should be testing them, okay? Okay, so how often do you report ELAS records in CalPads and when? When do you report ELAS records in CalPads? Fall one, okay. And do we report everyone, every fall one? Okay, Don says when there is a change in status, that's right. Okay, so we report uh, CELA records in CalPads if the student is enrolling the first time, and so it could be a TBD status, and there are no existing ELAS records in CalPads. Second, when let's say you already have a TBD in CalPads and the TBD has been there for more than 90 days. So that means you haven't reported the, the updated status of that student. So you, if you don't want to trigger a CERT 106, um, error, which keeps you from certifying, then you have to update the TBD status. And then of course, when a student has a value change in their ELAS status, okay? So you don't submit all SILA records of all your students in CalPads every year. You only submit those that require an update and those that are TBD that has to be tested, okay? That's it. Otherwise, you'll be clogging the system and CalPads will slow down further. Okay. So again, you know, let's do, let's now check the uh, file that we uploaded earlier. But I uploaded that file, let's see. So we go to view submission and look at the SILA file, oh. Upload field, expected column 15, actual column 13. Okay, I may have made a mistake there. Okay, so um, we won't be able to um, see any errors in the valid, in the view submission page. However, we could trigger it manually online in CalPads. Okay, let's just do that instead because I may have to re-upload this with the correct file later on. Okay, so let's just say 
We have a student, Jimbo Jones. Let's see if Jimbo has a SILA record. Where's SILA here? SILA. Ah, there you go. So Jimbo Jones does not have a status in CalPads and he just transferred and he's grade level 10. So we add a SILA record in CalPads if you, if you haven't submitted a batch file, you can manually do this in CalPads by adding a new record for uh, under the student detail section. Go add a new record. We then indicate the status date since um, enrollment start date was 821. We then use first 821, August, 15 and then it turns out that the student was EL and was not previously reported in CalPads by last year for some reason. And so now you notice that the status date is here and then you have your status codes that you can choose from in the online maintenance and you also have a correction recent code. This is only visible and available in online maintenance. If you need to make corrections uh, to a student status later on, this is where you do it. You add this record in, indicate the reason for that status, and then indicate the primary language. But since this student is an EL, let's just say we have here is Filipino, we validate that and validate post successfully. Okay, so we have the student here at Berkeley EL and on 815. And so later on, we this student then comes back saying, okay, we made a mistake on our home language survey. There was a, we, we don't want to be treated uh, uh, tagged as an EL. So what do you do? You can go back here and add the status of EO, choose the correction code appropriate to a transfer from EO to, from EL to EO. There's um, a, the, val code, the valid code combinations would help you um, determine what code to use. So let's go here and choose home language survey error. And then we choose English instead. So this is easy if the prior record was posted after 7-1-2018. Any record posted after 7-1-2018 can be corrected in CalPads using a correction code. If this was before 7-1-2018, the only way to get rid of this EL is to contact the other LEA and delete the record. That's it. Um, and then you can put your EO. However, you don't just request them to just delete that. You have to have proof that um, this student has to be, has to be, um, corrected, the ELS status. Also, if this was tested prior during the cell process, the only way to, to get rid of this EL is then to reclassify the student as RFEP. You still have to test the student and then do an RFEP, okay? So that's how you add a record in and using a correction recent code. So let's say the student Again, wanted to be, you, you got the student, you then um, mark them as TBD. Because apparently this student doesn't speak English at all, even though they claim that the student was TBD. So if from EO to TBD, you don't need a correction code, okay? And I'll show you why later. 
Spanish, validate, and we get this plethora of errors. So you have SIGA 255, invalid change in English language status code, 281, invalid English language status code for student, and date out of sequence 285. Okay, so, so now you're, you're, you're facing a daunting task of uh, resolving these errors. So first you have to go back, just cancel this, and survey the historical uh, information. So from EL to EO and then TBD. So now if this is a TBD, then make sure that the status date is after these records. You can just um, request a TBD and do a date before any of these records. Otherwise, you'll get a 255. And that's what, that's what the error, that's the reason why the error triggered, okay? The SIGA 255 or 285 is because it's out of sequence. So let's go back, do 18. TBD, no recent code, Spanish. I think this we might trigger a different error in this. It's greater than the current system date. So you cannot, um, you cannot um, submit a record in advance, okay, of the status date. So since this is 917, let's just assume that, let's just change this. To nine sixteen. Let's see if this would work. This might trigger an error as well. Two eighty three. So your SIGA mismatch. If your submit the SIGA two eighty three triggers when you're submitting a, a record with the same status but a different date. Okay. So this happens often for LEAs who who submits files to CalPads with a different date although the student already has an existing status of the same status in CalPad. So if you get a SILA 283 for a student who came from a different district, and this, that means that the status is the same and that you're reporting, there's no need for you to report the record in CalPads, okay? So those are the errors. So I guess we'll have to delete this and then start over. So, but then, that's those are the complexities uh, that you encounter when reporting SILA records. So let's move back. Let's go back to the SILA file and let's discuss why. Okay. So then we click on the details because this is the normal home language survey and ELAS status um, flow. Okay. So you have here your home language survey. The student then gets TBD or EO. And then based on the scores, the student could be an IFEP or an EL. If the student is EL, then the student can then be qualified, can qualify uh, later in the year to test, to uh, be on, to take the summative testing. Once you take the summative testing and you, and the student then, um, comes up as fluent, then you mark the student as RFEP, okay? However, if you notice here, EO can go to TBD without any correction because this flow, call flow here does not require a correction code. As long as you're following this flow, you don't need a correction code. Any other jump between statuses would require a correction code. So let's say if the student is EO and you want them to re be reported directly as RFEP or EL directly as IFEP, then you will need a correction code, which is listed here, okay? So just note that you can only submit a correction code if the prior status was reported after 7-1-2018. If the status was reported before that, then you won't be able to use a correction code. You may need to contact that LEA and have them delete the record, or um, you may need to just 
our FEBDA student, or if ever you may also need to contact CalPADS to delete the record for you if possible. Okay, and so now we then, let me just then um, shift back the training to uh, Nate for the SPED and SSRV file process. So you all should be seeing special education. All right, so um, as we know, students with disabilities data has come from what was the 144, the primary disability um, and uh, district of accountability, right? It was just three fields, maybe two fields related to uh, special ed data to now complete data set. It's gonna require at least four different fields in full implementation. For fall one, there's gonna be two fields, the SPED and the SSRV, and that's coming directly from the student education system or student special education system and to CalPads via API, right? And so SPED records are used to identify the student's uh, plan, service provider, service location, a little bit of feedback, I'm sorry, uh, report the duration and frequency of services, determine eligibility for testing accommodations, exemptions from testing, and the SSRV identifies the uh, services uh, that go with a student's uh, program or special education program. Get like a tinging. So the API looks just like this, right? Practical application, it's real fast, it's lightning fast. Um, the API allows your special ed system, whether it's say Cyrus, Wellagent, to interact with CalPAS directly. Uh, your special ed person will still need you to provide them with credentials and roles appropriate for the submission um, because you can't uh, enter data into CalPads anyway without uh, validating your authorizations. Uh, and then the rejected records come directly into the special education system, right? And there's various implementations. This is all dependent on the special education vendor. So the SPED and SFRV records that are applicable for fall one will be the programs and their services, right? Test setting accommodations, um, post-secondary information is later on in the year. Um, it's important to note that students who have been referred for services, those that have parental consent, and may be pending evaluation of census day should be reported. This means, what this means to you, the data coordinator is, your special education system uh, coordinator might ask you for an SSID for a student that has not been placed in any school, right? I need you to enroll the student but I have no place for you to enroll them. So in that scenario, what is one solution for enrollment? Does anyone know? I guess we'll have to make a slide for it. Um, we all have a code, right? That's e equivalent to our district code, right? So under school of attendance, if you looked at the drop down in CalPads, you would have the district number as a school. You can enroll those students at the district if you don't have a designated special education school for these type of students. So that's not putting them at school A or school B, it's putting them at the district. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the data being used for compliance monitoring is going to be transactional. That means uh, evaluations that are initial, annual, triennial, amendments to meetings, changes in data are transactions, right? Uh, so all that's going to go. What that means to us is nothing. We, we're used to this. All our files are transactional. We have massive data sets. But your special education person, this is new to them. So when they get overwhelmed with 100,000 of errors, you're going to have to show them your methods of troubleshooting to whittle down those errors and to get the data submitted to CalPads. Because previously in case miss, a student had one record every year. Now those same students will have multiple transactions 
which equates to multiple records. And although we're not responsible for submitting the special education data, uh, we are the LEA. We have to certify this data. And so we're going to have to share our knowledge and our practices with our special education folks. Okay, and so I do have, if I don't tell on myself here, um, so this is, uh, you all can see CalPads, like um, it's just in the top right corner, staging calpads.org. I don't hear Marshall saying no. Do we see CalPads? Yes. Okay, so uh, what do we have? Submission. Yeah, yeah, that's where we want to be, right? So I'm looking at an SSRV file. I'm in staging. This is in my data, so I didn't want to potentially review an actual student. So we're just real quickly, I wanted to show you that for your district, and if the data comes through API, this wasn't su submitted by me, um, you can see that B. Mark Huntel, uh, Brian, he's a vendor at Cyrus, submitted this file, right? You can see that I have visibility. If it's in my LEA, I can see it, and I can see the results, okay? All right, and so we can help them. They get the same thing in SACE or Cyrus or Wellagent. Whatever their special ed system is, they get the same error, the same number. So if they need a no, like, invalid SSID for a student, you can see the student's demographics. You can give them the correct SSID, so on and so forth. Uh, you know how to use the error list to troubleshoot required field missing, right? And you have the service desk. You know how to contact us, and we can fumble around and work through the errors because we don't know the answer because it's new to us, too. But together, we might have some answers, all right? And so then... Let's look at a student. I think I got a fake student on deck. Oh, crap. I thought I did. Is this, oh my goodness. So I only have one fake student data. I thought I had the SSID waiting for you. Let's see if I could find the student and not reveal real student data. So as you can see, staging is not much faster than production. Um, and Summer had one pass record. And so we're going to look at this student from Moore Park Unified. A fake student. See, the student's name is CISA Service Desk. And so you know it's a fake student. And at the bottom, you have special ed and student services. So this particular student triggered an error, or no, it didn't, it passed. So you see all the special education records for the student uh, throughout their career, academic career. And then the services. And the last thing to note, we can look at these records in detail, but notice there's no way for us to edit the record, right? All of that has to come through the special education system. There's no post, validate, delete, nothing. Okay? And so you can see the special ed uh, data in CalPads. And so with that, I mean, I don't know if you have any questions of special ed. Um, we're working on a data population to make it easier for the, the, the special ed people, but also the LEAs to understand the data uh, and the requirements. Um, but I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. So I think we're ready for a wrap-up. And so we focus on the batch file submission, right? To recap, here's the process. You prepare the data. You begin with your enrollment file. You upload the files in sequence, SCNR, SINF, program, CELA, then through API, the SPED and the SSRV. You review the submission status of each file. Of course, you can't do that for the SPED and the SSRV. You review the records. You post the past records. 
then you resolve the rejected records, right? That's examining the error in the rejected record, the CalPads ODS, making changes in your student information system, then uploading the new file. That's step eight, right? Seven corrected record in your local sys, then you upload a new file. And then you do it all over again. So there's seven, eight steps for each file that you may have to repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, right? You do it over and over again until you have a file submitted with no records. Then you move on to the next file in the sequence. This takes days, this takes weeks, this can take months, so you should not delay. Request your SSIDs pronto. And then we went through all of this. Now we're ready for the wrap up. So here's a quick summary. Uh, you do not need to update the LAS of incoming students transferring from other California schools. Those statuses already exist in CalPads. Kyron demonstrated this. Enrollment records must be posted first to establish ownership of the SSID. Demographic information is required for all students. State level matching cannot be performed without demographic records. So the student information, those demographic records is important. A lot of times we update our student enrollment. One key thing is if you populate your student enrollment in October, but don't update your demographic ma matches. When the November direct certification pulls, you won't have matches because we don't have birth date or address or race ethnicity data to match those students to. All we have is a name from the enrollment. TBD status is required for all students whose home language survey is other than English. Program eligibility is counted from the program start date or is counted if the program start date is on or before census date. No end date can be on the record prior to census date. It has to be after or there can be no end date. It has to be an open record. The SPED and SSRV files are submitted through the special education system into CalPAS through the API. So here are some suggested milestones. What you should be doing right this minute, completing the student profile data population in your student information system. As students are enrolling into your district, you should be submitting that information. Your registrar should be updating the student's enrollment information in the CalPads along with everything else. Um, this is a good time that once you have that information, start your file submission. All those files, the SNIF, the SENR, the SPRIG, the SELA, the SPED, SSRV, all can be submitted. But remember, until you as the data coordinator can upload the, SS, uh, the SENR, all of those SPED records are going to be incomplete and trigger a validation. They're going to get GER 5s. Uh, resolve certification errors, right, anomalies. Review snapshot reports and update records as needed. Send reports to local data stewards, site leaders, and administrators for approval. So it's not just you saying the data is correct. Uh, submit this data and provide it to those who have specific information, whether it's an EL program coordinator, special ed program coordinator, the person who's in charge of GATE. Give them all versions of reports that they can review and verify this is accurate. Then you can certify the data and feel good about it, or at least not be responsible for any mistakes. Then, very importantly, you should have your data approved by December 6th, because that will give yourself a two weeks to make the CalPAS initial deadline, right? The self-approval needs to be by 1220 for your enrollment and uh, LCFF disadvantaged student counts to, to be included in the P1 for your LCFF, all right? So we need that data. So going forward, what should you do? Your next training will be reporting and certification advanced. If you've done this before and this was boring and you don't need training, Slyman's advanced training's for you. If you learn something or were reminded of something, the regular fall one reporting and certification that's coming would be best for you. Advances for people who only need minor uh, informational updates and changes. 
Reporting certification talks more about the data, the subgroups, the process, okay? Um, one thing we didn't include was uh, if you attended this training, it was heavy into functionality and file submission. On Friday, we're doing a version of this training that's going to be online maintenance where we talk about the individual data elements at length. So it's going to be two hours talking about what this field means, what that field means, what this field means. Did you have something to add, Kyron? Yes. So um, also, if you don't, if you, if your if that schedule is on is in conflict with your schedule, then um, you can do a self-paced training at least for the um, SILA and the SPRG file. There, there's two separate uh, SILA data population and SPRG data population training that you could um, view on your own pace. And the self-paced is recorded with narration, uh, so you can rewind it fast forward. That's why we call it self-paced. The st uh, student enrollment and the student information haven't been recorded, but there are PowerPoint attachments available, which have a great deal of information, too much to have in this consolidated training. And so, with that, uh, you have resources, right? That's Bridge. That's where you're going to get self-paced in the PowerPoints from. They're attached to the trainings. Um, you have a YouTube channel, so anyone who does not have a Bridge account, you can direct them to YouTube shortly after the training. So by next Friday, there should be a recording of this uh, training after Kyra and I have perfected it. Um, you have the CalPads user manual, which is essential documentation for the who, the how, and the why of what you're doing, the, uh, the one, two, three basic steps of how to get it done. That's in the user manual along with the mapping guides. And then the LPAC, English Language Proficiency Assessments for California, will give you information about students' ELA status, how it integrates with CalPads, and the requirements. So if you need help, you have a CalPads monitor always available to you, but you have, for immediate help, the service desk. And the service desk is best contacted through the, uh, the URL at the top of the screen that ends in default ASPX. We also have an email, right, that gets collected into a box and dumped into our service desk. It's not as timely as going directly with the URL, but you can reach CalPads through the email. We have a phone number that gets transcribed into an email that gets dumped into the service desk. So even this takes a little bit longer, but if you can't remember anything but 916-325-9210, you can get in contact with us. Please temperature your expectations for service with the phone number because there's two processes it has to go through before it gets to the service desk. And then there's the FIGMAT listserv. It's an open line of communications that LAs use to talk amongst themselves, resolve problems. We at CSIS uh, add content to the listserv sometimes, but mostly it's one LEA helping another. She has Aries, he has Aries, they talk to each other. He has power school, they have power school, they talk to each other, they resolve their problems. And so with that, we greatly appreciate your, your time and uh, your feedback that you spend with us. Um, so, we wanted to say thank you, and so unless you have any questions, that's it for today. And uh, Marshall and Kyron like to expend their greatest gratitude for your attendance today. <laughs>